The Emerald Tablets of Toth the Atlantean is a book that has shaped generations of truth seekers since its publication in the 1930s. It reads as a first person account of the god Toth explaining his past life in Atlantis, its downfall, and his becoming immortal through his learning of the secrets of life and death. It is said that Toth imparted this knowledge onto Egypt and left behind secret teachings hidden away in protected chambers secured by his students and priests. In the book, we learn that it was Toth who designed and constructed the Great Pyramid of Giza as a sort of initiation temple with built-in sciences to help rejuvenate the soul and break it loose from the confines of physical reality. Toth has long been equated with knowledge and wisdom, a symbol for spiritual ascension. The succession of Toth as an archetype within sacred teachings goes far back, of course starting in Egypt. In this documentary, I'll be briefly moving through the progression of how Toth became this deified figure of wisdom calling to us through his writings and monuments left for us to decipher. Toth originally belongs to the pantheon of Egyptian deities. He is attributed as being the god of writing and wisdom. He is at times symbolized by the moon as a lunar deity. The worship and mention of Toth goes far back to the earliest of Egyptian times, making him one of the most ancient of deities within their literature. He is a prominent figure within Egypt's oldest texts such as the Pyramid Texts, which are also some of the world's oldest religious texts still in existence. His role in Egyptian culture spans about 2,000 years up through the decline of ancient Egypt into modern times. His name is usually pronounced Toth or Thoth, but both are translations of the more accurate Tehuti or Jehuti. Because of the archaic nature of his name and history, there are no conclusive answers as to what his name means or from where it derives. Jehuti is usually translated as he who is like the ibis. Usually depicted as an ibis, ibis-headed man or a baboon, Toth is sometimes said to have been self-created. He is titled as a god without a mother. The oldest known depiction of Toth as an ibis-headed god comes from a rock relief from the Sinai area. It was carved during the reign of Khufu. He is frequently referred to as the chief judge, depicted in afterlife judgment scenes where he inscribes the altercation and helps weigh the sins of the soul. In almost any Egyptian sanctuary, there was a designated Toth area. Toth appears virtually everywhere in the major religious writings of Egypt. Throughout Egyptian lore, there is mention of a Book of Toth, a mysterious and powerful collection of writings from the god himself. It has survived in various manuscripts. It comprises of a dialogue between a wisdom-seeking disciple and a master, Toth. It is seen as a precursor to the Hellenistic Hermetic writings. The many remaining fragments of these writings are preserved from Greco-Roman era texts. They were mostly written in the Demotic script of Egypt. Demotic Egyptian is a later fortified style of writing that progressed from the pictorial hieroglyphic form. The term was first used by the Greek historian Herodotus to distinguish it from earlier styles of writing. The Book of Toth was most likely put together by scribes from what is known as the House of Life. The earliest references to a House of Life comes from a royal decree of the late Old Kingdom about 2200 BC mentioning the requirements of the House of Life but not providing any information on its scope. Two Stella of the late Middle Kingdom, 1850 to 1700 BC, record a man named Keku with the title Scribe of the House of Life, beside a colleague with the title Chief Physician. The word scribe illustrates the connection between the institution and writing. In the late period, there may have been a house of life in each of the main temples throughout Egypt. We learned from a 6th century BC statue from Persian occupied Egypt known as the Naphorus statue of Ujahoresnet, 
that several houses of life were restored. The house of life was a term for a general institution that focused on physical healing, religious rites, and also the inscribing of sacred knowledge pertaining to these practices. They are primarily remembered as scribal houses and libraries with important knowledge. Within the text, King Darius I employs an Egyptian physician named Uja Horesnet to go back to Egypt to restore and reorganize the staff of the various houses of life. This was done so after it was realized that the Egyptian knowledge and practice of healing had severely lost its potency. After King Darius I broke his ankle, the Egyptian physicians could not heal him. Rather, it was Democrates, a Greek physician who was the superior in the situation. Because of this incident, King Darius I commissioned for the Egyptians to reinstitute their customs to restore their intellect. Going back to the Book of Toth, the text details a dialogue between a deity, usually called He Who Praises Knowledge, assumed to be Toth, and a mortal known as He Who Loves Knowledge. The work covers such topics as the scribal craft, sacred geography, the underworld, wisdom, prophecy, animal knowledge, and temple ritual. The Book of Toth is a name given to many Egyptian texts supposedly written by Toth, the Egyptian god of writing and knowledge. The Egyptian historian Manetho said that Toth wrote 36,525 books. The church father Clement of Alexandria, in the sixth book of his work, Stromata, mentions 42 books used by Egyptian priests that he says contain the whole philosophy of the Egyptians. All these books, according to Clement, were written by Hermes, a pre-existing Greek god that the Greeks likened to Toth claiming they were the same God having similar qualities, example, both invented writing. However, translations from the Egyptian language and concepts to the Greek language and concepts were not entirely accurate and some Egyptian authenticity was lost. The Book of Toth, the collection of writings ascribed to him, have been debated to be the source for the later Hermetica. Some scholars deny that it is a source for the Hermetica, whereas many see a clear correlation. Researchers Richard Louis Jasnow and Carl Theodore Zauzich put together the first modern translation of the Book of Toth during the 90s in their The Ancient Egyptian Book of Toth, a demotic discourse on knowledge and pendant to the classical Hermetica. The original fragments of the Book of Toth are written in Demotic Egyptian, however, only date back to about the 2nd century AD. They were discovered in Roman libraries. Both the Book of Toth and the Hermetica consist of dialogues between Toth and his student. There are similarities in some of the subjects and phraseology within the dialogue of the two texts. The most interesting piece of evidence for the Book of Toth being antecedent to the Hermetica is the fact that both of the texts use the title of the Thrice Great or Great Times Three towards Toth. More so, they use this title specifically during a conversation where knowledge of immortality is revealed to the student, causing the student to rejoice and praise. In the Book of Toth, he is called the Great, 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 and in the Hermetica, he is called O Trismegistus, meaning the Thrice Great. The origin for the name Trismegistus is not clear. Los Angeles professor of history and philosophy, Brian P. Copenhaver, relates that this name is first found in a meeting of the Council of the Ibis Cult held in 172 BC near Memphis in Egypt. Professor and author Garth Fowden believes that the earliest occurrence of the name was in the Athenagora by Philo of Biblios circa 64-141 CE. There is, however, an inscription of Toth found at the Temple of Esna that is substantially similar to his later Hermetic title. The Temple of Esna began construction in the 14th century BC and was completed much later during the 2nd century AD. The inscription of Toth reads as follows, Greatest of the great, best of the best, much greater is he than all the gods.
Herodotus, the old world grand historian, was probably the first to equate the Greek deities as renditions of the Egyptian gods. In his writings during the 5th century BC, he presented correlations with the Greek god Hermes and the Egyptian god Toth. Some scholars now refute this correlation, however, it was regarded as legitimate for many centuries. During the Hellenistic period of the Greek Empire, there were revivals of mysticism and legend. When Egypt was annexed by the Alexandrian era of Greek rule, the Ptolemaic dynasty initiated a renaissance of the arts with the constructing of the Library of Alexandria. The library was situated in Egypt in the city of Alexandria. From that era, there arose a great interest in translating Old World scriptures into Greek. The most famous of these translators was Manetho. It was he who introduced Egyptian mysticism, theology, mythology, history, and chronology to the Grecian world. He lived in the late 4th to mid 3rd century BC. He was a priest of Heliopolis, a major capital city in Lower Egypt. He was deeply versed in Egyptian knowledge and well trained in Greek academia as well. He wrote on the history and philosophy of his country. It was from his writings that many of the Hellenistic and later Christian world would depend on. Sadly, his books are almost completely lost. We only have fragments of quotes by later writers. We have a quote of Manetho mentioned in a preserved work by Georgius Sincellus in his Sothis, presenting this in the 8th century AD. The book of Sothis relates that Manetho addressed King Philadelphus, the second Ptolemy, personally writing in the 3rd century BC as follows. The letter of Manetho, the Sebenite, to Ptolemy Philadelphus. To the great King Ptolemy Philadelphus, the Venerable, I, Manetho, High Priest and Scribe of the Holy Fanes in Egypt, citizen of Heliopolis, but by birth a Sebenite, to my master Ptolemy send greeting. We must make calculations concerning all the points which you may wish us to examine into, to answer your questions concerning what will happen to the world. According to your commands, the sacred books written by our forefather, thrice greatest Hermes, which I study, shall be shown to you, my lord and king, farewell. Manetho wrote this because Ptolemy had expressed a strong desire to see the documents from which Manetho derived his information, and the high priest promised to let him see them. The Egyptian esoteric traditions transformed during the Hellenistic period into what would become the Hermetica. The Hermetica are works of revelation on occult, theological, and philosophical subjects ascribed to the legendary Greek divine sage Hermes Trismegistus, who was believed to be the inventor of writing and the sacred sciences involving geometry, math, and magic. The collection, written in Greek and Latin, probably dates from the middle of the 1st to the end of the 3rd century AD. It was written in the form of Platonic dialogues and falls into two main classes, popular Hermeticism, which deals with astrology and the other occult sciences, and learned Hermeticism, which is concerned with theology and philosophy. Both seem to have arisen in the complex Greco-Egyptian culture of the Ptolemaic and Roman periods. The Corpus Hermeticum includes several texts, some of which are the Poimandris, a collection of 14 sermons, the definitions of Asclepius, and the Perfect Sermon, or the Asclepius texts. The latter is no longer available in its original Greek, but only in an Old Latin version. Philo, the great Jewish Alexandrian scholar, wrote in his History of the Phoenicians that Toth is the Greek Hermes, strengthening this hermetic belief in Toth as being the source of esoteric wisdom. Tertullian of Carthage is the earliest known writer to clearly quote from the Philosophical Hermetica in his Adversus Valentinianos and the De Anima, both composed around 206 and 207 AD. There are, however, earlier references to Hermetic texts. Galen of Pergamon mentions a treatise on medical botany by Hermes Trismegistus that was supposedly well known in the first century. 
famous 4th century philosopher Iamblichus wrote in his On the Mysteries that it was Hermes or Toth who Pythagoras and Plato derived their sacred knowledge from. Plato mentioned Toth in his Phaedrus, stating that Toth was an olden god who had invented many arts, including the art of writing. Many scholars throughout the ages have questioned whether the Hermes-Toth connection is true. Some see it as a simplification, a mere combination of similar philosophy following a generic line of thinking. Others see it as a sort of cultural appropriation, both natural and deliberate. During the Hellenistic era, it was natural that both the Greeks and Egyptians would find similarities in their beliefs. However, it would be the later emperors who would see it necessary to blend their beliefs with those of their foreign subjects to make ruling the masses much easier. Quoting from Copenhagen's Hermetica, we get a deeper idea as to the importance of synchronism between the two worlds. Ptolemy, one of Alexander's generals, took control of Egypt in 323 when his master died, styling himself Ptolemy Soter, savior, in 305. After hundreds of years of ruling over Egypt and having their neighbors, the Romans, also take part of her land, eventually the Romans took over the area. Ten centuries had passed since Alexander's taking of Egypt, having three empires, the Greek, Roman, and Byzantine, have their way with the land. Copenhagen goes on to say, and sometimes synchronism was a political tool for the aliens, the most famous instance being the cult of Serapis, manufactured under Ptolemy I. Given the association of Osiris with death and rebirth, it was natural to suppose that the dying bull of Apis became Osiris, yielding the amalgamated Osirapis or Serapis. Sculptors depicted Serapis with the head of Zeus, which expressed Ptolemy's wish to show Egyptians how their beliefs could blend with the Greek. Thus, the new emperors were taking advantage of the inherent religious piety of the masses to assimilate them into new religious customs that would instill indoctrination into the generations to reconcile their subjugation by foreign rulers. The idea of a school of knowledge being passed down to us from a single source, the wise god Toth, took hold in the classical world and developed into further fanatical additions. Vedius Valens, a Roman astrologer, writing in Greek in the second century CE, left behind a hermetic text of astrology. This text is a supposed translation of a work from a pharaoh named Nikespo and high priest Petosiris, who claimed to have been taught by Hermes. Copenhagen also tells us about the influence that hermetics had on alchemy, saying, Another kind of occult wisdom attractive to early Hermetic authors was alchemy, which made its first literary mark on Egypt after 200 BC in the writings of Bolos Democritus of Mendes. The vestiges of his work show that Bolos described processes involving gold, silver, gems, dyes, and other substances that became the main ingredients of the alchemical work. After Bolos, but before the Christian era, a number of alchemical treatises began to appear under the names of Hermes. These alchemical hermetica were known to Zosimus, a native of Panopolis, who lived in Alexandria around 300 CE. Zosimus left behind works that meshed hermetic philosophy with alchemical practices. The prologue of the first book of the collection, called Coronides, says that the god Hermes Trismegistus received this book from the angels as God's greatest gift and passed it on to all men fit to receive secrets. Healing and magic were also prominent aims of another large body of text that often refer to Hermes and his retinue, the Greek and demotic magical papyrus. The documents that scholars have included in this category cover a considerable span of time from the 2nd century BCE to the 5th century CE, and their contents are mainly spells of practical intent meant to conjure a god or demon, bring a vision or a dream, foretell the future, attain invisibility, compel a lover, thwart an enemy, catch a thief, ease the pain of gout, or drive insects from a house. 
the magical or spiritual aspects of the Corpus Hermetica, the compilation of texts attributed to the knowledge of Hermes Trismegistus, seemed to focus on salvation through Gnosis. It was a sort of precursor to Gnosticism, the belief in salvation through the initiation of specific knowledge about the reality of life and God. Without Gnosis, one would simply live ignorantly, never attaining spiritual ascension because it is a discipline earned rather than given. As is attested in the definition of Hermes to Asclepius under the axiom, he who knows himself knows the all. Although there was never really a clear connection between Toth and Hermes Trismegistus, the archetype took hold and gave rise to some of the most influential pieces of spiritually esoteric literature known as the Hermetica. Lactantius was an early Christian author who became an advisor to Roman Emperor Constantine I, guiding his Christian religious policy in its initial stages of emergence, and a tutor to his son Crispus. Lactantius, writing from the 3rd to 4th century AD, wrote about Hermes in his The Divine Institutes. Lactantius believed, like many of the Western scholars of his time, that Hermes Trismegistus was a Greek rendition of the god Toth. What made him unique was that he began to project Christian ideals onto the legend of the Hermetic lore, as we see in this quote, but that there is a son of the Most High God who is possessed of the greatest power is shown not only by the unanimous utterances of the prophets, but also by the declaration of Trismegistus. Hermes, in the book which is entitled The Perfect Word, made use of these words, the Lord and Creator of all things, whom we have thought right to call God, since he made the second God visible and sensible. But I use the term sensible not because he himself perceives, for the question is not whether he himself perceives, but because he leads to perception and to intelligence, since, therefore, he made him first and alone and one only. He appeared to him beautiful and most full of all good things, and he hallowed him, and altogether loved him as his own son. Lactantius was quoting a hermetic text that spoke of the Creator designing an emanation of itself, whose purpose it was to perceive itself, a sort of allegory that perception and knowing of the Creator is true gnosis or connection to God. It is a very intriguing claim within the text that God loved this creation as his own son. Early Christians, of course, saw this as a precedent for Jesus Christ. Naturally, as the classical world transitioned into the modern era, remnants of the past mixed with the new beliefs of the Christian world. In the amazing 1945 find of the Gnostic text within the Nag Hammadi collection, there were fragments of known Hermetic texts like the Asclepius and also newly discovered doctrines. Hermeticism was a natural predecessor and even more so contemporary of Gnosticism, which was born out of the same years of the early Christian era. St. Augustine, the famous church father, writing in the 4th to 5th centuries AD, understood this to be the case, saying, We are by nature Gentiles, as Paul says, born under another law and with other prophets, whom the Gentiles call seers, and from them we were afterwards converted to Christianity. Surely, if there are, as rumors has it, some prophecies about Christ from the civil or from Hermes, called Trismegistus, or Orpheus, or any pagan poet, they could, to some extent, help the faith of those who, like us, are converts from paganism to Christianity. Augustine and others like him saw pagan wisdom, like that of the Hermetica, as a revealed truth by the Christian God that would prepare the Gentiles for Christianity, which would be the completion of the truth as embodied by Christ. This concept was later expanded on by famous 15th century Italian philosopher and Neoplatonist Marsilio Ficino. He believed in what was called a Prisca Theologia, 
ancient philosophy and that through the pre-Christian wisdom and mystery school teachings, God was subtly foreshadowing his miracle and revealed truths. The philosophy of Prisca Theologia taught that all real truth belongs to one line of divinely inspired knowledge. Famous pioneer in modern psychology, Carl Jung, spoke on the origins of some of the Hermetica in a lecture in 1940. In this lecture, he explained some of the Arabian origin stories for the famed Tabula Smaragdina or Emerald Tablet. The text of the Emerald Tablet first appears in a number of early medieval Arabic sources, the oldest of which dates to the late 8th or early 9th century. It was translated into Latin several times in the 12th and 13th centuries. Numerous interpretations and commentaries followed. Medieval and early modern alchemists associated the Emerald Tablet with the creation of the Philosopher's Stone and the artificial production of gold. It has been popular with 19th and 20th century occultists and esotericists, among whom the expression, as above, so below, a modern paraphrase of the second verse of the tablet, has become an often cited motto. It is a short text but has influenced esotericism immensely. Reading from E.J. Homeyard's 1923 translation as follows, we can see just why it has been so impactful. Truth, certainty, that in which there is no doubt, that which is above is from that which is below, and that which is below is from that which is above, working the miracles of one, as all things were from the one. Its father is the sun, and its mother the moon. The earth carried it in her belly, and the wind nourished it in her belly, as earth which shall become fire. Feed the earth from that which is subtle, with the greatest power. It ascends from the earth to the heaven and becomes ruler over that which is above and that which is below. This text has always been attributed to Hermes Trismegistus, and although its earliest manuscripts are of Arabic origin, many believe it to be a copy of an older Greek version, as Young extrapolates in his lecture, saying, Its origin is unknown, and we do not know if it was originally Greek though there are certain indications pointing to this conclusion. The Greek word telesmo in the Latin text has perhaps remained unchanged from the original form. Young also details the mythical Arabic account of the Tabula Smaragdina being found by the legendary Apollonius of Tyana. Apollonius of Tyana is a figure who is said to have lived in the first century AD. He is an ambiguous character who is likened to that of Christ, with similar stories as Christ, such as traveling, performing miracles, getting into philosophical debates. Some scholars believe Apollonius of Tyana was a real historical person person that early Christians copied from to construct the archetype of their Messiah. The earliest and so far most detailed source on the pre-Christian character is Life of Apollonius of Tyana by Philostratus. He wrote the biography at the request of Empress Julia Domna. Young relates that in the early Arabic versions of the Tabula Smaragdina begin with a fantastic account claiming that Apollonius of Tyana had found some treasure within the Pyramid of Giza. Among this treasure, he found the Emerald Tablet. In its opening scene, Young translates as follows. Apollonius, known as Bellinus in Arabic, states that, As I entered the chamber above which the talisman was hung, I came upon an old man sitting on a throne of gold, who had an emerald tablet in his hand. Young analyzes the text sentence by sentence, saying, The end of the text says, so, I am called Hermes Trismegistus, for I possess the three parts of the philosophy of the universe. What I have said about the operation of the sun is finished. The sun is another word in alchemistic language for gold, so presumably Hermes has been describing the art of gold making or alchemy. The two terms are synonymous, but the sun can be understood differently as the light of day, a symbol of consciousness. So, to speak, a primeval consciousness related to the one of the beginning, and through adaptation, the consciousness of each individual arises from this primeval consciousness. So, the operati solus, the transformation of the gold, could also mean the transformation of that light which we have received through adaptation from the deity. 
in other words, the transformation of our consciousness, end quote. Among the evolving Christian world was born Islam, a new contender for monotheism. With precedence in the old world, Islam naturally would assimilate similar stories and archetypes of old world religions and myths. With obvious anachronistic ties to Christianity and Judaism, early Islam also had subtle hints of Hermeticism within its mythology. Its vague ties to Hermeticism were bridged by the philosophers of Haran. The small city of Haran, a place rich in history with roots to ancient Mesopotamia in modern day Turkey, just north of the Syrian border, has been a fierce defender of its pagan beliefs. During the Christian conquest and empire expansion, Haran aggressively held out against Christian rule and religious assimilation. Having to undergo this fight again with the onset of Muslim infiltration, the Haranians of the 7th century succeeded in making a pact with its Muslim invaders. The caliphs of the time agreed to allow the Haranians to maintain most of their pagan customs and even made academic allies of them. The Haranians adopted an Islamic name for themselves taken out of the Quran to show respect and some assimilation. They then called themselves the Sabians, a sort of Gentile group of the Quran. The famous Haranian scholar Tabit ibn Kura was employed by the Muslim leaders to travel and translate Greek and Syriac texts into Arabic. The importance of the Haranians is that they held a devout belief in the god Hermes. By the 9th century, they held Hermes as a prominent prophet within their religion. As Kevin Van Bladel details in his authoritative 2009 book on the subject, The Arabic Hermes, From Pagan Sage to Prophet of Science, the Haranians learned of Hermes from a succession of Greek and Persian philosophers. This line was passed down to the Arabic scholars closely tied to early Islam. Theodore Abu Kura, early 9th century AD Bishop of Haran, wrote of his ancestors, saying that the core of their religion was the worship of the planets and zodiac. The ancient Haranians believed it was these celestial bodies that govern human life. Theodore also claimed that the prophet and astrological sage of their religion was none other than Hermes. Wab in Munabi was crucial in weaving Christian and Judaic beliefs into early Islam, threading a truth between the three Abrahamic faiths. He is also accredited as the first in Islam to connect its famous prophet Idris with Enoch and subsequently Hermes. Idris is the second prophet mentioned in the Quran. It is said within Islamic lore that the prophet Idris was a sage of metaphysical sciences. Idris in the Quran is likened to Enoch having spent time in heaven. Later Arabic scholar Al-Mashar would expand on this, adding to the Idris-Enoch connection and also adding a dramatic change to the thrice greatest aspect of Hermes, claiming that he is called so because there were three Hermes throughout history. He is quoted as saying, there were three Hermeses. As for the first Hermes, the Persians called him Hosheng, which means the just. The Persians say that his grandfather was Kayomarth, that is, Adam. The Hebrews say that he is Aknuk Enoch Idris in Arabic. He was the first man to talk about such things as the motions of the stars. He was the first man to build temples and praise God in them. The first person to study the sciences and medicine and talk about them. He was the first man to give warning of the flood. And he foresaw the advent on earth of a great catastrophe coming from the skies by fire and water. He resided in Upper Egypt. As for the second Hermes, he was one of the Babylonians. He lived in the city of the Chaldeans in Babel. He lived after the flood. He excelled in medicine and in philosophy, and he knew the nature of numbers. Pythagoras, the arithmetician, was his pupil. This Hermes revived what was lost of medicine, philosophy, and the art of numbers in the flood in Babel. As for the third Hermes, he lived in the city of Missouri, and he came after the flood. He is the author of the book of Venomous Animals. He was a physician and a philosopher, and he knew the nature of deadly medicines and harmful animals. He wrote a beautiful and valuable book about alchemy, which is related to many crafts, such as the making of glass, glass objects, clay, and the like. He had a disciple by the name of Asclepios who lived in Syria.
Here we see a fascinating tale conjured by al-Mashar, which is an Arabic culmination of the centuries of Hellenistic Judeo-Christian Hermeticism. What is intriguing here is the flood account that al-Mashar details is something that has been passed down through not just mainstream religion, but specifically esotericism and Hermeticism. It is said that Hermes knew of the great flood and preserved wisdom and knowledge in texts which he hid to be found after the Great Flood. The story of Atlantis was primarily popularized first by Plato in his Timaeus and Critias. The Timaeus and Critias is a set of dialogues among Socrates and a few of his students. Upon conversing about ancient Athens, Critias dispels a story about Atlantis, which was told to him by his grandfather, who heard it from his grandfather, thus Critias' great-grandfather. This ancestor, named Dropides, heard it first from a friend, famous Athenian statesman, poet, and social reformer, Solon. The dialogue was written in the 4th century BC by Plato. It was meant as an epic to be recited at the Panathenaea, a celebration that took place every four years to commemorate Athens and its accomplishments. The tale is seen as a fable by most scholars, but could hold some truth. Plato reveals that the tale was told to Solon by an Egyptian priest. In the text, this priest disparages Greek wisdom, saying to Solon that they know very little about the ancient past. He says that this is so because time and time again, the earth has lashed out cataclysms that have destroyed civilizations. This priest reveals to Solon that his people are remnants of a greater past which was lost to war and annihilation through earthquakes and floods, saying to Solon, Oh, so long, so long. You Hellens are never anything but children. There is not an old man among you. There is no old opinion handed down among you by ancient tradition, nor any science which is old with age. And I will tell you why. There have been, and will be again, many destructions of mankind arising out of many causes. The greatest have been brought about by the agencies of fire and water, and other lesser ones by innumerable other causes. The Egyptian priest told Solon a great tale about his ancestors who fought back against an arrogant kingdom of people known as the Atlanteans. These Atlanteans, however, were not always a warlike people. They were a fascinating people who had a beautiful and prosperous island kingdom with a strong economy. They were rich in resource and gold. However, according to Plato's relating of the dialogue, the Atlanteans grew arrogant, as the priest states. For many centuries, as long as the divine nature lasted in them, they were obedient to the laws and well affectioned towards the God, whose seed they were. For they possessed true and in every way great spirits, uniting gentleness with wisdom. They despised everything but virtue, thinking lightly of the possession of gold and other property, which seemed only a burden to them. Neither were they intoxicated by luxury, nor did wealth deprive them of their self-control. But they were sober and saw clearly that all these goods are increased by virtue and friendship with one another. But when the divine portion began to fade away and became diluted too often and too much with the mortal admixture and the human nature got the upper hand, they then, being unable to bear their fortune, behaved unseemly, and to him who had an eye to see grew visibly debased, for they were losing the fairest of their precious gifts. But to those who had no eye to see the true happiness, they appeared glorious and blessed at the very time when they were full of avarice and unrighteous power. Plato goes on to tell us that eventually this kingdom attempted an attack on the lands of Egypt, Greece, and other neighboring countries about 9,000 years before the time of Solon. The priest reveals to Solon that it was his ancestors, an army of Athens, who stood alone and fought back against the Atlanteans, driving them to their island, saving the rest of the countries from being destroyed and enslaved. Unfortunately, these Athenian heroes met a disastrous fate 
when on the island of Atlantis, a massive earthquake caused the islands to sink in a flash, flooding and drowning not only the Atlanteans, but also the Athenian heroes. This tale is seen as a parable to give credence to the classical Athenian history during Plato's time. The tale of Atlantis is one among many flood myths that were told by the ancient world. Many in the modern esoteric community equate Atlantis to a golden age, specifically one where Toth once lived. There are many who claim that the sacred books of Toth that were spoken of in ancient Egypt were preserved from an Atlantean era. Freemasons often speak about the pillars or vaults of Enoch. In these vaults, it is said that there was placed a book of sacred knowledge. Other versions state that Enoch erected two pillars, which on each was inscribed sacred knowledge. Each of the legends attests that this was done so to preserve knowledge after the great flood was to sweep over and destroy civilization. This myth about the pillars of Enoch has precedent in the Christian world. Byzantine historian of the 4th and 5th centuries, Philostorgius, wrote a similar tale more than 1,000 years before the onset of institutional Freemasonry. Philostorgius, in his Ecclesiastical History, recounts the historical tale of Emperor Julian the Apostate attempting to rebuild the Temple of Jerusalem. In the tale, he claims that some of the workers had found a secret vault in the temple which led to a darkened chamber with a book in its center saying of the matter that as soon as he touched this pillar he found lying upon it a book wrapped up in a very fine linen cloth and as soon as he had lifted it up as he had found it he gave a signal to his companions to draw him up again as soon as he regained the light he showed them the book which struck them all with astonishment especially because it appeared so new and fresh considering the place where it had been found this book as soon as it was opened shows the following words in large letters in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god End quote. This tale developed through the years to what would become the Enoch legend of hidden pre-flood knowledge. There is also what is called the Book of Enoch, which is a compilation of books written from the 2nd century BC up to the 5th century CE, which are texts attributed to Enoch. In the entire collection, simply known as the Book of Enoch, we learn that Enoch was shown secrets of astrology, nature, life, and death by God's angels. Enoch was the great-grandfather of Noah, the protagonist, survivor of the Great Flood. Enoch was warned about the flood and told to warn his descendants and to pass down some of the secrets he had learned. The Book of Enoch was once a part of the biblical canon, but later during the Roman years of Christianity, was excluded from being taken serious as a divinely inspired work. In Louis Ginsburg's 1913 work, The Legend of the Jews, he presents post-biblical Jewish legends stretching from the 2nd century to the 14th century. In what are generally called the rabbinical works, we also see aspects of the Enoch legend. It is revealed through Ginsburg that Enoch was given a holy book to study from, and in that book was sacred knowledge. Eventually, the book got into the hands of Noah, where it was passed down to King Solomon after the flood. As the texts say, it descended through Jacob. Levi, Moses, and Joshua to Solomon, who learnt all his wisdom from it and his skill in the healing art and also his mastery over the demons. In rabbinical legends, there is told a story about King Solomon prophesying the destruction of the temple and therefore hiding sacred knowledge and artifacts in a vault. In a fantastically early Freemasonic work printed in 1734 in America by Benjamin Franklin, known as The Constitutions of the Freemasons, written by a Reverend James Anderson, we see this legend in full circle as Anderson writes, Enoch erected his two large pillars, the one of stone and the other of brick, whereon were engraven the liberal sciences. Now, of course, Enoch is a Judeo-Christian character, but it would be the occult primarily through Freemasonry that would popularize the theory that Enoch was another form of Hermes Trismegistus and thus Toth. Famous 19th century author on Freemasonry, Albert Mackey, explained this in his work, The Legend of Enoch, writing about 100 years after Anderson's passage on Enoch, saying, 
It is true that Enoch has been supposed to have been identical with Hermes and Idris. Among the Hebrews has been called Enoch. Among the Egyptians, Osiris and Hermes, and he was the first who before the flood had any knowledge of astronomy and geometry. Mackey goes on to quote 18th century pioneering Mason Chevalier Ramsey, who was among the first official Freemasons heading the organization in France, saying that Ramsey was too learned a man to be ignorant of the numerous Oriental traditions, Arabic, Egyptian, and Rabbinical, concerning Enoch that had been long in existence. He refers to the tradition extant in all nations of a great man or legislator who was once the first author of sacred symbols and hieroglyphics and who taught the people their sacred mysteries and religious rites this man he says was among the phoenicians tout the greeks hermes the arabians edris but he must have known that tout hermes and edris were all synonymous of enoch for he admits that all these lived some time before the universal deluge and that they were all the same man and consequently some antediluvian patriarch the myth of antediluvian knowledge passed down directly from god or his angels to a faithful enoch or toth then inscribed to be discovered for usage after the great flood has propelled the hermetica into a dramatic source of new age wisdom Throughout the legends of the antediluvian pillars of knowledge, there is the imagery of two pillars, sometimes described as one of stone and one of brick. This is frequently represented in Freemasonry as the two pillars of Boaz and Jachin, which are meant to represent the Temple of Solomon, however, could have underlying motifs in the pillars of Enoch. Famous Freemason leader, scholar, and writer Albert Pike also furthered this concept in his authoritative work, Morals and Dogma, saying, Manetho extracted his history from certain pillars which he discovered in Egypt, whereon inscriptions had been made by Toth, or the first Mercury or Hermes, in the sacred letters and dialect, but which were after the flood translated from that dialect into the Greek tongue and laid up in the private recesses of the Egyptian temples. The legend continued on to the 20th century and famous esoteric writer and pioneer of the New Age philosophy and wisdom, Manly P. Hall's Masonic, Hermetic, Kabbalistic, and Rosicrucian Symbolical Philosophy. In his grand work, he exclaims that, According to legend, the Book of Toth was kept in a golden box in the inner sanctuary of the temple. There was but one key, and this was in the possession of the Master of the Mysteries, the highest initiate of the Hermetic Arcanum. He alone knew what was written in the sacred book. The Book of Toth was lost to the ancient world with the decay of the mysteries, but its faithful initiates carried it, sealed in the sacred casket, into another land. This book is still in existence and continues to lead the disciples of this age into the presence of the immortals. No other information can be given to the world concerning it now. But the apostolic succession from the first Hierophant, initiated by Hermes himself, remains unbroken to this day, and those who are peculiarly fitted to serve the immortals may discover this priceless document if they will search sincerely and tirelessly for it. The two pillars and secrets of Toth do have precedent in ancient Egyptian tales. In what is known as the West Car Papyrus, found in the early 1800s, written in about the 18th to 16th century BC, professes of secret chambers of Toth. In the tale, the pharaoh Khufu sends his son to find a mystic named Dedi, who knows of the chambers of Toth. This mystic, it is said, was 110 years old and could perform amazing mysteries. After Khufu and Dedi meet, they have an interesting dialogue as is follows. Then King Khufu said, It is said that you know the number of chambers in the sanctuary of Toth. Dedi answered, I beg your pardon, I do not know their number, but I know where they are kept. And His Majesty said, So, where? And Dedi said, there is a box of flint in a room called the inventory in Heliopolis, and it is in that box. 
Some scholars have translated the words number of chambers as the secret dwelling, such as Donald Mackenzie in his 1907 Egyptian myth and legend, rendering the translation as Khufu attempting to locate the secret temple of Toth. Co-founder of the Golden Dawn, a secret society devoted to the study and practice of the occult, metaphysics, and paranormal activities during the late 19th and early 20th centuries, William Wynne Westcott wrote about the esoteric pillars in Egypt, saying of them, In the ninth chapter of the Egyptian Ritual of the Dead, they are referred to as the Pillars of Shu and the Pillars of the Gods of the Dawning Light and also as the northern and southern columns of the gate of the hall of truth in the 125th chapter they are represented by the sacred gateway the door to which the aspirant is brought when he has completed the negative confession the archaic pictures on the one pillar are painted in black upon a white ground and those on the other in white upon a black ground in order to express the interchange and reconciliation of opposing forces and the eternal balance of light and darkness which give force to visible nature the pre-flood pillars are described in various forms of being black and white and also one being of stone and the other one of brick so that one can survive a flood and the other a fire famous first century roman jewish historian josephus wrote also about this tale adding all the sons of seth being of good disposition dwelt happily together in the same country free from quarrels without any misfortune happening to the end of their lives the great subject of their studies was that wisdom which deals with the heavenly bodies and their orderly arrangement in order that their discoveries should not be lost to mankind and perish before they become known by the force of fire and owing to the strength and mass of water they made two monuments one of brick and the other of stone here josephus states that it was the sons of seth who inherited the knowledge and erected the pillars this is an important conjecture for it was the enoch of all the esoteric legends that would be born of this line the many scriptures of the Corpus Hermeticum had been lost over millennia since their inception in the early centuries of the Common Era. It wasn't until the Italian Renaissance brought on by the commission of the famed Medici family that some of the Hermetica would be rediscovered. Cosimo de' Medici was the patriarch of the Medici dynasty. He was a wealthy banker and politician who had a fascination for the arts and antique. In the mid-15th century, during his rule, he instituted the Platonic Academy of Florence, which was dedicated to seeking out, translating, and reviving Greek works of philosophy and wisdom. One of Cosimo's men happened to come across an old manuscript of the Corpus Hermeticum. This was such an amazing find that Cosimo halted the work being done to translate the works of Plato to focus on the Hermetic text. He employed then famous Italian philosopher, astrologer, and authoritative translator of the Florence Academy, Marsilio Ficino, to translate the newly found treasure. Ficino would be the first to translate the Hermetic text and publish it in 1471 into a Western language reviving the lost knowledge for all to benefit from. He wrote in his later Theologica Platonica that it was Hermes who was the wise sage who initiated a school of thought that would be passed down eventually to Plato. As we have seen, the legend of Hermes Trismegistus has its roots in Egyptian tales about the books of Toth and the attributes of this deity. The Hermetic legend took shape through the Hellenistic era, culminating into what would be a fanatical tale about a figure intertwined in all religions and myths as a mystical character secretly guiding the world's greatest ancient sages. The legend has only continued to be adored, entertained, and added to. In today's esoteric community, there is the final capstone on top of all that has been claimed of Toth, the god of all esoteric knowledge, and that final edition is none other than the 1930s publication of The Emerald Tablets of Toth the Atlantean.
The Emerald Tablets of Toth the Atlantean is an esoteric work that has taken the entirety of the Toth Hermes myth and hyperbolized it. Originally published in 1939, the book has 13 chapters, all professing to have been written by the god Toth. The contents of the book start by Toth declaring his authority and place among men as Master of Mysteries, Keeper of Records, Mighty King, Magician, Living from Generation to Generation. The purpose this Toth wrote the book, as it is alleged in the text, was to inscribe his greatest of knowledge before he descended into a sort of cryogenic state, leaving his body underneath the Great Pyramid of Giza in a hidden layer while his consciousness astral projects to higher dimensions. As he explains in this quote, now for a time I descend, and the men of Chem shall know me no more. But in a time yet unborn will I rise again, mighty and potent, requiring an accounting of those left behind me. The book is intriguing, going into the mysteries of life and death, astral projection, the outer limits of the universe, different dimensions, magic, entities, and more. This Toth claims to have originally lived in Atlantis prior to the Great Flood. He was a witness of the destruction and reveals that Atlantis fell due to a corruption within its political spheres. This corruption, he says, came about after a league of evil spiritual entities infiltrated and possessed the people of Atlantis, as is seen in these quotations. Speak I of ancient Atlantis. Speak of the days of the kingdom of shadows. Speak of the coming of the children of shadows. Out of the great deep were they called by the wisdom of earthmen, called for the purpose of gaining great power lived they in Atlantis as shadows, but at times they appeared among men. A. When the blood was offered, forth came they to dwell among men, crept they into the councils, taking forms that were like unto men, slaying by their arts the chiefs of the kingdoms, taking their form and ruling over them. Only by magic could they be discovered. Many unbelievable things are stated in the compelling book. It's a reflection of much of the occult and esoteric rhetoric that had led up to that point. The actual author of the Emerald Tablets of Toth the Atlantean, Dr. M. Doriel, proclaims in the opening of the book that he was instructed by Tibetan monks from Shambhala to retrieve the tablets from a temple in Mexico, take them back to the Pyramid of Giza, and translate them. Doriel claims the actual texts were of emerald stone written in an Atlantean script. Doriel himself was an interesting character. Born Claude D. Dodgan, he was an eccentric person. He was a researcher and writer of occult and esoteric subjects, which were gaining much attention at that time. He eventually founded his own organization known as the Brotherhood of the White Temple. He claimed in various writings that this was an offshoot of the main center in the Himalayas known as the Great White Lodge. Originally from Oklahoma, he had a sporadic upbringing with a lot of moving and jumping from job to job. He was sort of a charlatan, with some records claiming that he was a World War I vet and also using the title doctor, with no clear records for him either being in the First World War or having a medical degree. He went through two marriages, leaving behind a couple kids with his first wife. Ending up in Los Angeles, among a bustling metaphysical scene, he would find his niche and move his way up the community. Starting his organization, he produced many books, pamphlets, and writings for local papers and magazines on occult subjects. In a Californian newspaper titled The Madeira Tribune, there is a brief excerpt about the growing mystic dated June 21, 1937, stating, Claude D. Dodgan was an authority on the occult, lord of the cycle, and the living Buddha to his cult disciples, but to his wife he was just a fake. He complained that she denounced him before his disciples, and she declared that he ran around with other women. Dodgan later changed his name to Maurice Doriel. It's not clear why, but one online source mentions that Maurice is a derivative of the Latin word for Moorish, Doriel, a play on the Arabic Dar al, or House of, as in House of Islam, or House of Wisdom. He would also move the headquarters of his organization to Denver, Colorado, progressing his mission as a mystic writer and leader. 
in an October 1946 issue of Amazing Stories magazine, Doriel wrote, I have had personal contact with the Dero shape-shifting reptilian entities, and even visited their underground caverns. In the outer world, they are represented by an organization known loosely as the Black Brotherhood, whose purpose is the destruction of the good principle in man. The underground cities and caverns are, in the most part, protected by space warps, a science known to the ancients but only touched on by modern science. Doriel would often speak on the Dero, or the evil snake-headed beings residing in the inner earth. He was a peculiar man with many wild claims. Growing up in a rural family, he didn't advance past elementary school. He heavily professed to be in contact with ascended masters, spiritual teachers who have transcended time and space, who relay sacred information to adepts such as himself. This was a growing theme in metaphysical circles. He wrote in personal experiences among the masters and great adepts in Tibet that when I was born into this life, I had a full and complete memory of my past lives and incarnations. I never had to study over again the forgotten things that most of us do. I did not have to learn and read and write. I did not have to learn mathematics or physics or chemistry or anything else because in the past I had acquired that knowledge and had retained my attainments of the past. He claimed on several occasions that he had traveled to Tibet to study with these masters who would bestow him knowledge to bring back to the states for the Great White Brotherhood. However, there was never any evidence for his travel. He would later denounce the claim and change his statement, saying that he traveled to Tibet via astral projection and not through physical means. His fanatical claims would grow to extremes, eventually getting into the realm of messianic end times prophecies. In some of his works in the 1940s, he claimed that there was a new age approaching and that an ascended master was to enter the world stage to usher this in, stating that the avatar will appear on May 2nd, 1956 in America. This is the day when the present earth cycle closes and the golden age of the seventh cycle will dawn. With the onset of nuclear terror and war, Doriel put together an extraordinary endeavor to build a spiritual center to prepare for the apocalypse, known as Shambhala Ashrama. Finished in 1953, it was a massive compound that included a hundred homes, a massive worship building, and food storage facilities. It cost $500 to move in, and Doriel assured his disciples that if nuclear war didn't happen, they could turn the sanctuary into a summer resort. Of course, nuclear war never happened, and the New Age Messiah never came. Doriel is purported to have passed away in 1963, leaving behind many great works of occult and esoteric subjects. Among the many works he published was, of course, the Emerald Tablets of Toth the Atlantean. Many works would follow similar format as Doriel's, claiming wisdom learned from the god Toth. This would evolve further into the New Age craze through the 80s and onwards with notable teachers rising and declining, many with amazing insight to add to the overall pseudo-Toth narrative, and many also taking advantage of the vague and mystical names attributed to the archetype. Above all, again, we have scriptures and wisdom collectively accredited to our ancestors, our spiritual sages, the gods who stand above human nature, written and preserved by pious and mystical men and women seeking the answer to life's greatest mysteries.